Chapter 7 Sunday, November 17th, 1734 The storefront is rampant with activity as apprentices rapidly turn out pages and hang them on the clotheslines to dry. John Peter Zenger and the journeyman assemble the uh, finished newspapers and put them into piles to be corded later. Near the wood-burning stove, young Peter Zenger slices bread and meat to make lunch for everyone. This was the ritual of Sunday, because the journal had to be on doorsteps all over New York come Monday morning. Set the place for yourself, son, says John Peter Zinker. Thanks, Dad, the boy replies. The journeyman gestures to a crate filled with cold water. And grab yourselves a bottle of suds too, boy -o. Peter Zinker smiles. You may have half a bottle, son, says John Peter Zinker as he looks to the journeyman and nods. If only he took to his studies as he does my work. Kids like going to work with their dads. I was on a fishing boat with my dad since I was ten. Ever miss the sea? Lost my taste for it in the North Atlantic, replies the journeyman. Waves roaring in a ship one way and tossing your guts the other. The journeyman chuckles. The bloody ship sunk in New York Harbor. Had to swim ashore. Lost my boots but kept my shillings. Without warning, the front door bursts open. The bells jingle and two red coats storm in with fixed bayonets. Before the apprentices can evade, they are knocked aside and sent sprawling to the hardwood floor. Tables are knocked aside and newspapers sit flying. Turning to the commotion, John Peter Zenger sees the hail of newspapers swirling before him and hears the sound of the rear door being kicked open behind him. He turns around to see two more red coats stomping in and sweeping their bayonets side to side. Confronted on both sides, all John Peter's anger and the journeyman could do is stand back to back, clench their fists, drag in a quick breath, and prepare to fight four men with muskets and bayonets. Stepping through the open door, Sheriff John Symes looks at the newspapers falling all around him. He snatches one out of the air and reads several lines of editorial. All the venal supporters of wicked ministers are aware of the great use of liberty of the press in a limited free monarchy. This is the speech of sedition! He balls up and tosses the newspaper aside. Peter Sanger watches the sheriff swagger through to the print shop and look down on the fallen apprentices. They're too afraid to even try to stand up. They don't even want to meet, him, meet the sheriff's cold gaze. The burly man walks to within arm's length of John Peter Zenger and looks down on him. So you're Zenger. And who's Papa to you? A wild smile cracks across the sheriff's weather-beaten face. He's looking for any excuse to break somebody today, and he knows the average printer can't last long with a skull crushed between two powerful hands. The journeyman, however, has seen this manner of behavior all too many times. Don't give him an excuse, Johnny. Lousy marionettes will shoot you in front of your own son, warns the journeyman sternly as he turns to the sheriff. Same as your touting kind did me dad, Belfast. The sheriff is disappointed that Zenger's not even going to put up resistance. Reaching into his coat, he pulls a warrant for arrest and unrolls it. John Peter Zenger, you are here, hereby apprehended for the printing and publishing of false and Seditious libels. These libels have raised factions and tumults in the minds of the citizens and caused contempt for His Majesty's government. You will be taken from this place and committed to prison or common goal immediately. Peter Zenger looks nervously between his father and the barrel chested sheriff. Then he sees the journeyman glance back to him and slowly wave his hand back. Understanding the meaning, Peter slowly backs toward the back door. Two redcoats near that back door pay him no mind as they grab a fallen newspaper and stuff it into a haversack marked evidence. He glances back to see the other two redcoats haul his father out the front door and cannot help but freeze as he remembers what happened last month to the last person he saw hauled away. He gasps, shoves open the rear door, and flees into the alley. Sheriff John Symes watches his men shove John Peter Zenger into a steel-plated horse-drawn carriage and padlock the hatch. He turns to one of the printing presses, opens it, pulls out a finished page, and glances over it. 
An intrusive piece of ordinance this printing press. This print shop will see its publication until all evidence is collected. He turns to one of the redcoats. You will stand guard until the inspector arrives. He swaggers over the journeyman. You and these apprentices will remain for questioning. The journeyman sneers at the sheriff. You're lucky you carry that sword and pistol. Man to man, I'd send you all to Lucifer, who you traded your souls to. The sheriff smiles. I can bring you down for heresy talking like that. Give an Irishman a badge and he thinks himself English, replies the journeyman with a sneer. The two Irishmen stand nose to nose. Neither give ground and neither blink. Chapter 8. A flame flickers atop a candle in the draft. Beyond it, John Peter Zenger stands in the stone or brick cell opposite Sheriff John Symes. A small bed is up against one wall, and nearby is a barred window looking out on the distant Hangman Square. You've been charged with sedition, Mr. Zenger, says Sheriff John Symes as he glances out the window at Hangman Square. The court understands you're a simple printer living on simple, small means. Easily impressed, easily swayed by the rhetoric of idealists. John Peter Zenger sighs. Do get to the point. The point, Mr. Zenger, is that we're here to identify those writers of libel. The court might go lenient with you. Explains Sheriff John Symes. There is still time for you to rejoin the faithful. Tell your prosecutor my faith is not in question. Aye, aye, true enough, admits the sheriff. Heresy, heresy is not the charge. Poor choice of words on my part. Yeah, it was. Will you furnish the prosecutor the names of the libelers, asks the sheriff as he paces impatiently. You should know we have our suspects, men who put a mere printer of Dutch texts up to the printing of insults disguised as Critical essays under columns of letters to the editor. You will name these men. In good conscience, Sheriff, I cannot. You understand what they can do to you? You cannot protect criminals. They are men, women with different opinions. Nothing more. Jean, I have no problem with different opinions, says the Sheriff as he points to his own head. So long as they are kept within one's own school, these libels and the libels who write them have caused turmoil, like casting a stone and hiding behind a horse to let the bloody animal take the blame. You don't know them. The sheriff takes seconds to analyze what Zenger is saying. Does he mean these men were idealists, worthy of protection? Or did they threaten him if he revealed them to the Crown's authorities? The Sheriff wants to manipulate the situation and uncover some truth. Something that could earn him some leverage. Bolster his position with that governor. But he had to admit, he was not the manipulator that his British bosses were. He spoke too plainly. Are you certain you do? This turmoil began the moment Rip Van Dam was removed as governor. His friends put you up to attacking his successor, William Cosby. Who are these friends? Who are these people you hide? Zenger says nothing. He wants to smile as if alluding that he knew so much that the sheriff did not, but he prevented himself from doing so. He would give the sheriff nothing to use against him, or anybody else for that matter. To do that would make him no longer useful, and those no longer useful got the back of their heads ventilated. Or they took a swim with rocks in their pockets. Or they danced in midair while a rope crushed their larynx. Or four horses dragged their limbs down the block, in opposite directions no less. Or their head got put on a spike. There were probably dozens of other ways to get snuffed out, but Zenger did not feel like counting them all at this moment. He'd have plenty of time to wonder how live burial might feel later. 
John, simply name those who attacked Governor Cosby and left you to shoulder this punishment. In your conscience, man, is this right? I understand your point of view. Can you understand mine? The sheriff shakes his head. Oh, no. No, Jean, I cannot. I try. But I cannot. Sheriff, inform the prosecutor that I can accept no comfort. Very well, says the sheriff as he walks toward the cell door. It's your head in the basket, Deutschlander. Sheriff John Symes pounds on the door. John Peter Zegger watches as the red coat opens it and the sheriff exits. The red coat does not even bother to look at it, but just slams the door. The locks tumble. The cold wind blows between the bars, extinguishing the candle and leaving the cell lit only by a thin shaft of moonlight. Chapter 9, November 6, 1734. The sight of the hangman standing atop the gallows was enough to generate a crowd within minutes. Some came with morbid fascination with death and a secret dread that someday others might gather to watch them dance at the end of a rope. Others came to bear witness to the passing of someone they might know. And then there were the few muttering blessings for the condemned. But there was no condemned brought to the top of the gallows. Instead, the hangman descends the steps and approaches a small bonfire burning beside the gallows. Then does he take a yard-long torch, dip it in the fire till it catches, and hold it high. Plenty of spectators are baffled with what they're seeing. The hangman carries the torch to the paddy wagon driver, a tall black man in a long gray overcoat. He thrusts the torch out to the paddy wagon driver, who takes it from him. Now the spectators mutter as if they're here to witness a live burning, and if so, which of the prisoners held in jail will burn and blister and bleed out? As I've come to understand, explains the first New Yorker, the prosecution is taking notice of issues 7, 47, 48, and 49 of Mr. Zenger's New York Weekly Journal. Line by line, do they look for libels? But, the, but what method do they, to, do they determine a word libel or no? Asks the second New Yorker. That I know not, replies the first New Yorker. Second New Yorker shrugs. But this, is this governor so terrified that he must order these journals burnt? The New Yorkers watch as the black paddy wagon driver steps past the crowd and touches the torch to a tall pile of New York weekly journals. Catching a blaze, the journals curl, char, and are consumed in flame. Ascending ashes and vapors rise, and the crowd steps back from the radiating heat. By his desperate reaction, does the governor do not appear to be hiding the truth in these ashes? He does, replies the first New Yorker. Beyond that, did he put a reward of 50 pounds for the conviction of whomever authored these libelous articles? Then Sheriff John Symes has learned nothing from Zenger. Nothing. A lesser man would be doomed. Mr. Zenger must keep distinguished company to have secured the legal services of James Alexander in this, as is the second New Yorker, though he never, he never vocally made notice of his suspecting James Alexander. Might have been one of those people that wrote those articles for which uh, Zenger was arrested for. He nonetheless had his conjectures, but making them public knowledge would be very dangerous and foolish. In a crowd of so many people, how many were spectators? And how many were the eyes and the ears of the state? All these well-meaning men could do for the time being was watch the journals smolder. Chapter 10 Wednesday November 20, 1734. An arched door left of the uh, justice's bench opens and two redcoat guards enter the courtroom on either side of John Peter's anger. He spent three days in the Cold Stone Jail and is very much looking forward to this nonsense being over with. He still wears the same clothes, but unlike so many others, 
He does not let his appearance suffer during his incarceration. His clothes are void of any soup stains. He is clean shaven and his hair combed proper. Sitting at the uh, prosecutor's desk, Francis Harrison watches James Alexander introduce William Smith to John Peter Zenger. The three men speak in low tones, but Harrison is accustomed to lip reading and straining his ears to pick up any words that might clue him in to what his opposition is planning. When that fails, he cups his hand behind his ear and pretends to be scratching his head so he won't look like he's eavesdropping. James Alexander glances over to Francis Harrison and sees the prosecutor, Richard Bradley, sit down next to the smug clerk. He is wise to Harrison, and as such speaks in low tones without moving his lips. William Smith, being middle-aged, is not so intimidated by a 30-something like Harrison, and has an amused smile on his face. Say nothing but the truth as you know it, warns James Alexander. Never embellish, never pause. Answer briefly, giving them nothing to use against you. I shall be quiet as the mouse, replies John Peter Zenger. James Alexander looks around the courthouse to see too many well-placed persons in society, all wearing the same overconfident grin. Be not a mouse in this place, John Peter, for we are surrounded by serpents. Looking across the prosecutor's desk, John Peter Zenger sees a snickering Francis Harrison speaking with Richard Bradley. He's seen Harrison about and knows what a manipulative little rodent he is. But the prosecutor, he's never seen face to face, though. He would recognize the name instantly. You are being condemned by the highest, says William Smith with an amused smile on his face. That man talking to the clerk is none other than Richard Bradley. The Attorney General, asks John Peter Zenger as he looks to James Alexander, you can't defeat him. Every Goliath has a weakness, is James Alexander's only reply. The doors in the back of the room open and Anna and Peter Zenger move up the aisle, taking their seats nearby. John Peter Zenger looks back to Anna and sees her nervously smile at him. The crowd is ushered by a single red coat into the room and it is then that John sees the well-dressed and impressive looking publisher of the New York Gazette, William Bradford. While the rest of the crowd takes their seats, William Bradford remains standing just long enough for John Peter Zenger to notice him. The elder man does not smile lest he give away something that will be seen by a red coat and take it for sympathy with Zenger's cause. All rise, howls the bailiff. He watches the spectators stand to face the bench. Turning about, John Peter Zenger sees the bailiff standing in front of the bench, unrolling a scroll. James Alexander eyes Judge James Delancey and Frederick Phillips as they enter the room and take their seats at the bench. John Peter Zenger can just look at James Alexander eyeing the judges and can sense the tension between them. For him, it's the trial of his life. For them, it's just the latest round in a very long fight. Hear ye, hear ye, calls the bailiff as he, as he reads the scroll. By order of the esteemed governor, William H. Cosby, this trial is convened on the 20th of November, 734, to hear the case against John Peter Zenger, publisher of libels, Justice James Delancey and Frederick Phillips presiding. God bless this honored court. God save the king. Showing no emotion as is usual, the two justices take their seats. Judge James Delancey picks up his gavel, hammers it on a block of oak, and watches as the spectators take their seats. It was no surprise to him that those well-placed in society were quicker to, to snap to and sit than those less fortunate who came to witness Mr. Zenger's persecution. Many of them seemed to eye the justices briefly, as if showing what little defiance they could before healing and taking their seats. Francis Harrison sits down at the prosecutor's desk, jots down a few mental notes on his parchment, and glances across to see Anna and John Peter's and John Peter Zinger clasp hands and exchange a few very quiet words before taking their seats. He could not help but feel disgusting jealousy for the two. 
but his only satisfaction came from the fact that he'd separate them once John was either publicly executed or sunk in the night following a ruling by the Star Chamber. Mr. Attorney, read the charges, commands Judge Delancey. Standing, Richard Bradley faces the judges and glances to a parchment in hand. Your honors, for the record, let it be known that John Peter Zenger, printer in the city of New York, did on the 28th day of January, in the seventh year of the reign of King George II, print, publish, and allow to be published certain false, malicious, seditious, and scandalous libels entitled in the New York Weekly Journal. These libels have scandalized and vilified His Excellency, the Governor, his ministers, and officers of the King, and brought them to suspicion and ill opinion of the subjects. John Peter Zenger had forgotten how many words these court officers enjoyed cramming into their statements to make them sound more intimidating to the general public. As a printer who actually had to place the blocks of type on a page, he always believed in economizing on words in a sentence. Having never handled type, these court officials had no such intention. James Delancey looks down on John Peter Zenger. And how do you plead to these charges, Mr. Zenger? Swallowing the knot in his throat and hoping nobody saw him do it, John Peter stands up, faces the judges very defiantly. Not guilty, Your Honors. Not expecting res resistance, both judges exchange glances and then look down at Zenger. They'd expected him to plead guilty. Surrender the names of those who authored the articles. Close down his shop in exchange for a little token time off his jail sentence and accept responsibility for the governor's heartburn. But to plead not guilty. Such defiance was a stoning offense. Mr. Zenger snaps, Judge Phillips. Do you know what your resistance opens you up to? Oh, I have a very clear idea, replies John Peter Zenger as the corners of his mouth rise. He has to fight to keep a smile from cracking out because he's enjoying the fact that he raised their ire. James Alexander was right. Every Goliath has a weakness. And by expressing emotion, did Judge Phillips show vulnerability? You stand accused of sedition, adds Judge Delancey. Do you know the penalty? Your Honors, I understand the difference between what I am accused of and what I did. Judge Delancey tries to hide his sneer. Surely you do not imply that we accuse and what you did are two different entities. Are you admitting guilt, your guilt? asks Judge Phillips. No, Your Honors, I am not. Appalled by Zinger's shrewdness, Judge Phillips actually trembles. Judge Delancey notices him do it and glances sharply at him as if telling him to go cold and show no further emotion to the eyes of the public. As both judges try to calm down, the last they need is James Alexander standing up and holding high a writ of habeas corpus. If it will please the court, the defense has respectfully requested that Mr. Zenger be admitted reasonable bail, announces James Alexander. He has made record of his worth, including debts, apparel, and tools of the trade. As such, his bail should not exceed 40 pounds. Realizing his chance to use art with the system, Judge Delancey smiles at James Alexander and nods as if amused by his statement. We have read your writ, Mr. Alexander. This court sets bail in the amount of 400 with two sureties to guarantee your appearance for trial. <laughs> your Honor, what is this injustice? demands James Alexander in outrage. Suddenly the spectators are grumbling their displeasure. Judge Phillips is taking nervous glances at the spectators and back at Judge Delancey who calmly lifts his gavel and slams it once. The spectators fail to stifle. The judge enhances his calm with several long, slow breaths. Hold your tongue, Mr. Alexander, says, Jim, ah. says Judge Delancey, followed by a louder slam of the gavel. He stares down at John Peter Zenger and points his gavel. 400 pounds or a swift return to confinement. Awed, 
John Peter Zenger turns to see the spectators jeering at the judges. Loudly does Judge Delancey slam his gavel several times. The J Judge Phillips glances at him as if wondering if his cohort is about to lose his cold composure. There will be order in this court, commands Judge Delancey. Mr. Zenger, I would ask you, can you raise bail? Looking down at his flat pockets, John Peter Zenger shakes his head as if saying he's broke. Behind him, spectators reach into their pockets to take up a collection. Hearing the jingle of coins, James Alexander looks to the spectators, then at the judges who appear amused that their court funds are about to be fattened. John Peter Zenger sees the spectators emptying their pockets and realizes the true intent behind the judges charging of high bail. His next thought is how much gets charged to the next falsely accused citizen. As a prisoner, he can do little, but if what little he can do ruins the judge's plan, he'd risk the consequences. Please, do not, do not give them what they want. Perplexed by Zenger's appeal, the spectators exchange glances and stop pulling their meager funds in collection. Shocked, Anna moves toward her husband. John, John, what are you saying? You cannot stay in there. William Smith is impressed by Zenger's commitment and smiles wider as he turns to the spectators. Citizens, this bail lay a charge is akin to a ransom. Mr. Zenger is correct. Do not pay this bail. He, then he turns to the judges. Pay this bail today and you encourage them to make hostages of you all. John Peter Zenger can see the grief-stricken expression crack on Anna's face and feels a sudden hollowness in his guts as he ponders the many ways he might be failing her and his children. But being in the company of educated men of ideals has rubbed off on him and he knows he no longer has a place on the sidelines. Judge Delancey ah. slams his gavel and motions the two red redcoats to mobilize. Guards! Away with the prisoner, howls Judge Delancey as he stands and waves his arm wildly. Bailiff! Bailiff, clear the room! Struggling through the spectators to move toward her husband, Anna can only watch as the redcoats grab him and drag him past the bench and toward the distant arch door. She cannot help but think, after embarrassing judges, John has only worsened what they will do to him. John! John! The bailiff moves into the aisle and motions the spectators to exit the room. Though they move toward the rear door, they have their attention fixed on John Peter Zenger as he twists out of the red, coast, the, the red coat's grip to look back at Anna and Peter. John! Anna! Anna! Eat the presses! Grabbing John Peter Zenger, the, world, the red coats wrestle him past the bench and toward the arch door. One of the red coats pulls a club and is about to strike it when James Alexander and William Smith take after their client. You! You're abusing our client, yells William Smith. Piss off, counselor, snaps the first red coat as he pulls open the arch door. John, I'll file for exceptions, announces James Alexander. You'll not disappear, I promise you. Stay back, demands the second red coat as he shoves James Alexander back. John Peter Zenger looks back at James Alexander with an ironic smile on his face as the red coat shoves him into the doorway. Do look at the bright side of it, Mr. Alexander. Today I am worth ten times that I was yesterday. Pulling John Peter Zenger through the doorway, the first red coat grabs the door and slams it closed in the face of James Alexander. Turning to William Smith, he watches the last few spectators be rushed out of the courtroom by the pushy bailiff. William Smith says with no trace of amusement on his face, the moment the public forgets him, He's a dead man. Chapter 11. The sound of the foghorn echoes from the harbor. Eating his soup on the windowsill, John Peter Zenger listens to Sheriff John Symes and a Quaker woman in the next cell. The fact that things of this nature were allowed to be heard by fellow prisoners was clear indication that no prisoner was ever meant to see the outside world again and tell anybody of the atrocities within. Either that, 
Well, Soames was a bloody idiot who didn't care who hurt his business. Hurt that whatever God you pray to is more merciful than the chamber, says Sheriff, Sean, Sir Sheriff Soames. His short steps can be heard as if he's walking in circles around her. There are no other footfalls, so it is unknown if any redcoats are in the cell or just standing outside. As harsh as Symes was, at least he never sexually assaulted a female prisoner. Well, not that anyone ever attested to, anyway. When thee comes before judgment, says the Quaker woman in a nervous but steady voice, may thee pray for the same. Quaker bitch! <gasps> Several loud punches followed by, th by agonized screams echo through the wall. Putting down his soup and moving to the wooden door, John Peter Sanger listens as, as the cell door is opened and slammed and the locks tumbled. The sheriff stomps away down the stone hallway while the woman sobs and coughs. Guys, is the block secure for the night? It is, sir, replies the second redcoat. And come with me. The chamber has business for us. There is the squeak of large oak door opening and closing, then the tumbling of locks. All that can be heard now is the Quaker woman rolling on the cell floor and sobbing. Sympathy for one's fellow prisoners was irrelevant in here. Prisoners never seem to involve themselves with one another lest they bring down the attention of the guards. And all too often, there was one less prisoner heard breathing in the neighboring cells when the first rays of sunlight streamed through the barred windows at early morn. Whatever these prisoners' hideous fate, only a few guards knew, and they were accountable to those who kept no physical records. For the only records of a star chamber were kept a few square millimeters within their skulls, and no one's God was watching. Hiding behind a parked carriage, Anna can see Sheriff John Symes in two musket-toting redcoats walk out of the alleyway, turn the corner, and walk down the block to be swallowed up by the fog. She drags in a slow, deep breath and looks to the windows to be certain there are no snipers. Then she reminds herself the British don't guard local jails with snipers. Looking both ways, she moves around the carriage then crosses the cobblestone street and disappears into the alley. In the darkness, she is invisible. All that is audible are the tumblings of locks. Finishing his soup, John Peter Zenger places the metal bowl on the floor near the door. He can hear from down the alley the slow squeaking of the oak wood door opening, then closing. He listens as he hears faint footsteps moving down the hallway. No guard moves so lightly. In fact, whomever is moving out there is not wearing boots, but moccasins. Native American made moccasins. Then a tapping at the door. John whispers Anna's voice through the door. He can't imagine how she got in here undetected. Unless, of course, they let her intrude to spy on them both. Quickly, he checks the barred window for the sound of any eavesdropper breathing outside, yet finds none. That does not mean they're not out there, though. Just that he cannot hear them. But he's been alone in his cramped cell for days with not a word to him, and right now his wife's voice is the most welcome sound he can possibly think of. It's no hallucination. He's sure of that much. So, he goes to the door. Anna, Anna, what are you doing here? If they come back, yeah, yeah, I know, says Anna quickly. Sean, listen, I spoke with Mr. Smith. What did he say? There was a long pause. There was a long pause. The words publish or perish came up. A rolled up piece of paper is stuffed through a knot hole in the wood door followed by a glass of India ink and a crow-quill pen. Anna, the court prohibits me ink, or... John, write a letter, demands Anna. Quickly! I'll print it in Monday's edition. Write what letter? A letter to your subscribers, she answers. Tell them why there was no edition last week. 
If the public forgets you, nothing will stop the judges from wronging you further. And if the guards see you, I'll be in the alleyway across the street. Push the letter through the window. Now hurry, John. Unrolling the paper, he hears the distant stomping of soldiers coming down the wooden stairs and leans closer to the door. If Anne is caught here, they might not even bother to try her. People have disappeared for less than aiding a wrongly accused person. He cannot believe that she would risk herself like this. Then again, when Anna Mullen takes a wedding vow, she's serious. So he should not be surprised by her devotion. Nonetheless, Anna, run! Someone's coming! Anna! She must have crept out the second she heard the soldiers, thought John, or they would have certainly been yelling at an intruder to stop. Likely she got through the alley the same way she got in. But how did she get through the locked door? Staying close to the shadows cast on the alley wall, Anna moves toward the street. Two redcoats march past the alley. Anna wants to breathe, but the sound will result in one of them taking a literal shot in the dark at her. There is a lump swelling in her dry throat that she's been wanting to cough out now. She feels lightheaded and suddenly nauseated. All either of them have to do is glance into the alley, and her three kids are orphans. But they don't. They just keep marching down the block. Anna's knees buckle, and she catches herself before her knees can strike the cobblestone. Slowly, carefully, she breathes in the cold night air and feels her lungs expand. The lightheaded sensation, the desperation, the flight response has her thinking she wants to be anywhere but here. So she runs out of the alley. Hearing Anna's footsteps, one of the redcoats rapidly turns around, drops to one knee, and aims his musket low. By trained response, the taller redcoat remains standing, sweeps his musket left, right, and left again. They see, here, nothing more. Fog merely issues over the wet cobblestones. No shadows move on the walls of the brick and stone buildings. Exchanging a glance, the two redcoats slowly turn and stalk down the street with their muskets pointed forward. Crouching low behind barrels in the opposite alley, Anna hears the two redcoats marching quietly away. She takes several breaths and the lightheaded feeling subsides. Still, there is the nausea. But if she loses her last meal in the alley, she knows the noise will alert someone. Or the scent of vomit will. So she stares up at the alley windows and hopes that no candle illuminates and that no one moves down to look to look down on her. She looks back across the street to the alley near the jail and can only wait for John to finish his letter and slip it through the bars. Hopefully, he's not in the mood to choose so many careful words and just writes a, prain, a plain and brief letter. Dabbing the crow quell plen in the uh, Indian, John Peter Zenger continues writing his letter while listening to any sound of locks tumbling at the door. Only a, only a few lines, but he has to read it to himself. To all of my subscribers and benefactors who take my weekly journal, gentlemen, ladies, and others, as you last week were disappointed of my journal, I think it incumbent upon me to publish my apology, which is this. Quickly does he dab the crow quill pen and continue writing. Chapter 12, Tuesday, January 28th, 1735. On this frigid morning are the two New Yorkers conversing with the Jerseyite near the alley beside the courthouse. Spectators walk up the front steps carrying day-old copies of the New York Weekly Journal, and the two redcoats guarding uh, the door do not even bother confiscating the newspapers. And there he be in his cell without pen, paper, ink, or permission to speak with anyone. Here does an intrigue enter the picture as his wife, Anna, pushes writing materials through a hole in the cell door, says the first New Yorker most, most enthusiastically. There does Mr. Zengel write his apology for the missed issue of November 18th, last year. The second New Yorker chuckles. The sheriff went absolutely amuck having to investigate how she entered at a locked cell block every week unseen since John's arrest. 
None of the none of that guards see her enter? asks the Jerseyite. Why no? answers the first New Yorker with a defiant guffaw. <laughs> Too busy rowing, I assume. She turns she returns to the print shop with letters written in John's hand. I know his scribble will attest to uh, to this letter's authenticity. Amazing the court permitted William Smith's petition for the journal to continue publishing, remarks the Jerseyite. Did he petition? asks the first New Yorker. There, uh, there was no mention of it. Or record. Perhaps some other arrangement was made, suggests the second New Yorker. It would have disappeared if not for his publications, as the Jerseyite. The first New Yorker looks down the alley behind the courthouse to see the jail and the barred window in the shadows where John is being kept. Credit his wife more than the ownership of a newspaper. He's the only man in those cells now. But the gallows have not seen use in many weeks, says the second New Yorker. The last event was the burning of the offending issues of the weekly journal. The first New Yorker speaks in grim tone. There are other means beside the public gallows by which a man may exit this world. Witness how privately the shopkeeper Birch was dispatched during his escape. The second New Yorker and the Jersey Eight look quickly around, making sure no passerby overheard the first New Yorker's comment. No one looks at them. No one points them out to the guards at the, at the uh, courthouse door. Suddenly the first New Yorker realizes his error and is himself slowly looking around to see if anybody heard him. The Jerseyite is the first to compose his content, content smile and portray an image of knowing nothing wrong. As it happens, says the Jerseyite, Zenger is not alone. Old, old Seamus was thirsty again last night. Oh, I do he, hope he was not dueling with his father's claymore again, sighs the second New Yorker. His grapple was only with the spirits, says the first New Yorker. Then may the end of this day's business see our mutual friend return to home and hearth, says the Jerseyite. Good day to you, gentlemen. Turning, the Jerseyite ascends the steps into the courthouse. The New Yorkers are about to follow him up when they see James Alexander walking out of the alley across the street. They glance about, observing for eyes. Then nonchalantly cross the street. The two redcoats standing at the courthouse doors watch the two New Yorkers cross the street, turn the Dirt, the darkly dressed James Alexander around and step behind a parked carriage. This is suspicious behavior, and the two exchange glances to acknowledge having seen it. Yet they make no effort as yet to report it. Perhaps their orders are otherwise. Sitting on the edge of his bunk, John Peter Zenger spit shines his boots while listening to a rustling in the next cell. He checks the barred window for eavesdropping guards and sees no and he sees no breath issuing in the cold air. Nor is there any sound of, of movement to be heard. He returns to work on his boots when a loud grumble proceeds. Very slurred words. Oh, where the hell do I find myself now? Pulling on his boots, John Peter Zenger chuckles but does not answer. He can hear a clumsy pounding echoing through the uh, wall, and something tells him this man in the other cell has a reservation in this place. Likely the only reason he never disappeared is that he never did or said anything inflammatory, or he's just seen as a harmless local rollicker. I say, can anyone out there tell me where I am? He had to know where he was. What he probably wanted to know was what happened after the floor came up and hit him in the head. Unfortunately, John had been in this 16 by 10 foot room, cold room no less, since last year, so he was more amused to find out how this talkative fellow ended up here. You are our guest in the governor's mansion, sir. Jesus, again. One would think I'd recognize the splendor of it by now. Could you tell me, sir, asked John Peter Zinger, how often you frequent this establishment? Oh, I happen in time to time on my way home from the pub. So drunkenness brings you here. Quite the contrary, sir. 
For I am not some drunken Irish lout sleeping off his revelty, revelry. I am a Scot and can hold me whiskey. If I wake within stone walls, it is cause the whiskey liberated some amorous intentions toward the ladies. A Scotsman are you? How came you to these shores? I owned a tanner's shop in Edinburgh, McDougall and Sons. Every gentleman in the city was clothed by me. You might have heard business was not good years back. I did, admits John Beater Singer. So I hear the streets be paved with gold here, and I sit there with me sons in 28. Business was no better here. Picking up his straight razor from the small table, John Peter Zenger dry shaves while talking through the barred window. He's glad to just be talking to anyone after months of incarceration, that he doesn't even care who hears what he has to say anymore. As long as he mentions no names, he figures he and those he protects are safe. McDougall and Sons, I'm not familiar with your shop. To my sorrow, it is known here only as McDougall Clothiers. Neither of my lads survive the ocean passage. Seamus McDougall can be heard shuffling heavily back and forth inside his cell. A devil resides beneath the waves of the North Atlantic. I am sorry for your loss, says John Peter's anger as his voice cracks. My father was claimed by those waves 24 years ago. Oh, that's terrible, laddie. What brought you here? I was 13 years old, and this British officer strides into the Palatinate. He enrolled a parchment, and he said, We do not live there anymore. We set sail on a rickety frigate. A few weeks out, we're hit by a storm. John Peter Zinger sits tiredly on the bunk, and you can actually hear the sounds of waves striking the frigate's hull. My father died trying to save the ship. Ironically, you ponder it. He dies trying to save the ship that took us away from our homeland. I never understood him. Aye. But do you now, lad? An ironic smile cracks on John Peter Zinger's face. He slowly looks up as if understanding his father's sacrifice. It was something no one else could have done. Today, I do. That's good, lad. That's good. A tragic loss, to be sure. But you weathered the storm. Now, if you don't mind asking what storm are you sailing through now, why are you here? I am the publisher of the New York Weekly Journal. The Weekly Journal? You? You be John Singer? I am. Well, aren't you the elephant trampler of the governor's garden party? Honor to meet you, sir. I hear you worked under Bill Bradford as, at his pandering gazette. You learned your craft with him. I was indentured to him for eight years. We authored a book together in 1725. He was good to me. Though he owes his success to a magistrate who just as soon cut his cords as to look at him. Hearing the lock tumblers move, John Peter Zenger looks to the door as it opens, and Sheriff John Sines takes a step in. He has a curious look on his face, as if he's heard some of what has been said. Pray, Mr. Zenger, asks Sheriff Sines. Turning away from the bar window, John Peter Zenger looks down his nose while dry shaving under his chin. Shaving! Your counsel has arrived, announces J Sheriff Sines. Five minutes! Sheriff Sime steps, steps back into the arched alley hallway and opens the next cell. John Peter Zenger leans forward on the bunk to see around Sheriff Sime's. He wants to catch at least a glimpse of the tailor because so many other prisoners have disappeared and he could only imagine what they looked like before being strung up or burned. The sheriff stands at the door of the cell, appearing amused as he looks at uh, Seamus McDougall. Seamus McDougall, bellows, he, bellows John Sime's. Top of the morning to you. Can you smell your name, sir? Seamus McDougall staggers and clears his throat. Capital M, little a, little c, capital D O U G A L. At last, rejoices Sheriff Sims. You're free to go. He watches Sheriff Sims step back and sees uh, Seamus McDougall. For brief seconds as he stomps out and trudges down the narrow arched hallway. 
The middle-aged Scot was well-dressed and clean-shaven, much as he imagined a man, a man such as he would be. This was the only man he ever saw walk out of this place. But Seamus McDougall was not on trial for treason, he reminds himself. Good day to you, Seamus McDougall, says Sheriff Symes. See you at the pub tonight. Aye, bellows Seamus McDougall's voice over the distance. And I'll drink you under the table this time too, you Irish dog. He closes the straight razor and cannot help but smile. Standing behind the cover of a parked carriage, the two New Yorkers watch several bystanders walk by before conversing in low tones with James Alexander. Their perspiration and glances at the courthouse guards betray their attempts to appear less agitated. James Alexander, as usual, seems jovial under the eye of the oppressor. Surely you know of the bounty, Mr. Alexander, warns the second New Yorker. It's not safe for you to be here, announces the first New Yorker. The governor commissioned 50 pounds on whoever wrote that scathing article about him, continues the second New Yorker. James Alexander shrugs and smiles. Can either of you gentlemen attest to my scribble? The New Yorkers exchange glances. You write with both hands, Mr. Alexander, proclaims the first New Yorker. And we only know the writing of your right hand, says the second New Yorker. Nothing of your left. Indeed, says James Alexander as he points to the right side of his head. I keep my idealism in my right mind, so to speak. That was a little joke. The New Yorkers exchange glances and muffled laughter. James Alexander shakes his head and smirks. A sad state of affairs when people cannot laugh in the shadow of a courthouse. Indeed, sir, says the second New Yorker with a nod to James Alexander. Then permit me to do my business and may our cause be well met. The New Yorkers watch James Alexander walk across the street and ascend the courthouse steps. They take a last breath of cool outside air and then look around to see no one in the windows above listening to them. Then they ascend the steps to enter. William Smith stands between the defendants and prosecutors desks facing the judges without so much as a blink. Francis Harrison dips his pen in ink and takes notes of all that is being said. The spectators seem more quiet than usual and leap forward to their benches. And as the grand jury finds no proof against my client, John Peter Zenger, I expect his discharge from imprisonment and return to his family, demands William Smith. Grimly does Judge Delancey look to Richard Bradley, expecting him to go up with anything to salvage their mutual case. Does the Attorney General have anything to add? Richard Bradley stands clutching his Bible. The accused John Peter Zenger is charged by information for printing, publishing, false, scandalous, malicious, and seditious libel. Then he seizes up two copies of the New York Weekly Journal in his other hand and holds them high for all to see. These journals are the Crown's evidence. I strongly advise Mr. Zenger remain imprisoned and his public publication discontinued. And the cause and the effects will follow. The defendant will stand, demands Judge Delancey dryly. Bewildered, John Peter Zenger looks to William Smith, then stands and stares back at the, to the judges with apprehension. John Peter Zenger, it is the decision of this court that you continue the incarceration, there to await your sentencing. Suddenly the spectators are grumbling words like, show trial, nonsense, and a few obscenities indigenous to the era amongst themselves. Anna can only shake her head in disbelief. John Peter Zenger feels the air compress out of his lungs as he struggles not to slump over in front of the enemy. As far as he was concerned, Bradley's mere holding up of those pages did not con constitute proof of any wrongdoing. The problem was, how can you make the judges and a biased prosecutor believe that? Unfortunately, 
The term railroaded did not ex exist yet to explain what was happening to him. Stand tall, son. This is only round one, says William Smith in a calm tone as a smile spreads on his face. He opens a legal text, looks under motions for jury trial, and then stands to the judges. Your Honors, in view of the prosecution's lack of evidence and the biases against my client, I intend to file exceptions to this ruling. Mr. Alexander. James Alexander stands and nods to the judges. Your Honors, we make exceptions to our client being judged by persons hostile to him, namely yourselves. And we do request a jury trial. Put your exceptions in writing, Mr. Smith, snaps Judge Phillips in a hostile tone as a false smile cracks on his face. We shall give them all the concern they deserve. He slams ah. his gavel once. Bad of next case. Watching the judges exchange talk in hushed tones, John Peter's anger sinks down in the chair and shoves his hair back. Anna moves with the spectators, leans over the banister, puts her arm around him and whispers in his ear. Suddenly his fatigue slides aside and a sudden alertness bolts into him. How can we be out of money? They've taken our accounts, explains Anna. Every shilling, frozen. Anna, talk to Smithers, Yancey, Carruthers, oh, and a tailor named Seamus McDougall. Ask them for money? Nine, 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 no, no. Advertise, says John Peter Zenger as a tired smile emerges. Every business needs to advertise. You can draw, set the type, sell them half a page, quarter page, whatever you can. John, I have never bargained before. Tell them our business can help their business. Even a few guineas per week will keep us in paper, ink. What about Mr. Alexander? asks Anna as her low voice lowers. He's being followed. John Peter Zenger looks over his shoulder and makes eye contact with the two New Yorkers standing toward the back of the room. Anna looks back at the men to see them nod. Then at John as he nods back. Those distinguished gentlemen are in gray suits. They're friends. Arrange for them to carry anything Mr. Alexander writes to you. Organize a network of locations you can leave and pick up messages. Never use the same route twice in a day. Never use the same Dropbox more than once a week. The friends will understand. Who are these friends? John Peter Zenger sees two redcoats step through the arch doors and realizes he's fast out of time. No time to explain. Talk to them and sell them as much advertising as you can. He kisses her and smiles confidently. Anna, I know you can do this. You're damn right I can, says Anna. She uh, kisses him and then uh, leans back across the banister. Reluctantly, she moves out of the courtroom with the rest of the spectators. Her attention is now focused on meeting these two New Yorkers and escalating her part in the cause. William Smith sits down next to John while keeping his eyes on the judges. I know you are not accustomed to inactivity, John. Say nothing. Do nothing they might use against you. Let them be their own undoing. Once again, the redcoats stomp toward Zenger, holding their muskets at port arms. They make the mistake of staring with mock bravery at William Smith, who stands and stares back until they both blink. Amused, Zenger stands up and shakes hands with William Smith. Well met, sir. We will talk tomorrow, says William Smith. James Alexander watches John Peter Zenger walk through the arched doorway with the redcoats and then turns to William Smith. While he knows the procedures in court, he can only conjecture what ill drama might confine should a star chamber go into session between now and the next trial date. My friend, says William Smith, we may have to lose a battle to win the war. I'll send a message to our friends in Philadelphia. End part two.